to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Solomon said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 following. As we think about practical books in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes is one of those books that transcends time and covenants in that its message is ever-changing, for man is always looking for meaning in life. What's life all about? Why am I here? Where am I going? How am I going to get there? What things are necessary along the way? And really, what things are full of meaning in this life? The book of Ecclesiastes discusses those type of things. You know, as we think about the quest for meaning in life, Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13 is the conclusion or the answer. And so we've got to ask, what is the question? If this is the conclusion, now we can understand what the whole book is all about. Well, what's the main question? Solomon, who's tried it all, wine, women, building things, gardening, whatever it may be, he's tried everything. And in his quest, he is searching for real fulfillment, real satisfaction, and meaning in life. And thus, Ecclesiastes is Solomon's quest for true purpose and meaning in, that, in this life. How then do we find that? Fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. To understand the book of Ecclesiastes, there are a few key terms that we need to understand. Like with most books, the key word is the word vanity. This occurs some 37 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon will be discussing some quest in life or something that he tried or, or some thought process and he will say, it's vanity. Vanity of vanity, says the, the preacher. It's like searching for the wind in essence. Well, what is the idea behind vanity? If something's vain, it's kind of useless. It's worthless. It, it has no meaning. Back in the olden day, when a woman may have been sitting before a, a piece of furniture, putting her makeup on, they often referred to that furniture as a vanity. Why? Because that's where you did things that in some ways were temporary. Some ways were going to not last very long. Looking in the mirror and just gazing at oneself was a sense of vanity. And so it's something that really doesn't have a whole lot of lasting meaning and purpose. Uh, Solomon will say, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse number 2. And then there's a key question in the book. And, and I think this is really one of the things that if we can grasp this, we can understand what the book is all about. Here's the question. He starts out by asking this, in chapter 1, verse 3, here's this question. What profit has a man from all his labor which he labors under the sun? Every morning you get up and go to work. You do it again all, all over again tomorrow. And so Solomon kind of steps back and he says, Okay, what profit does a man have from all his labor? under the sun? What purpose and meaning is there in all of life's ventures? In essence, Solomon is asking, why am I here? And why do I do the things I do? And, and what's it all about? That's the search and that's the quest that Solomon has throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. There's a key phrase that also occurs numerous times in the book. That key phrase is, under the sun. This occurs some 29 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. What's the idea of, of under the sun? Well, you can kind of vision things the way God has made the universe and, and earth, earth life, is under the sun. 
God being above, greater than that. And so when the writer, especially in the book of Ecclesiastes, mention, it says to himself, what profit do I have from all my labor under the sun? Under the sun would be equated with any type of earth life venture that doesn't bring God into the picture. And mainly, earth life and all the things that we have to deal with on this side of the sun. It's temporary. It's fading. Sometimes it seems even a little mundane if God is not factored into that as well. And thus, under the sun only considers the affairs of this life as an ends in and of themselves. As such, they're vain. Solomon will say, here's something I was doing, and I was doing it under the sun, and it was vanity. Why was it vanity? Because at that point in time, God wasn't factored into Solomon's life like he should have been. Thus, this is in contrast to the affairs of life in view of God, which the Bible says are not vain. Contrast this idea of working under the sun in the book of Ecclesiastes with 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. The Bible says, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, which we know our labor is not in vain. When we're working, when we're laboring, and God's at the center of that, it's not vain. Why? Revelation 14, verse 13 says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. A man could be the most powerful, richest man in all the world, running the biggest bank, running the biggest corporation, have as much power and money at the top floor of the biggest building that you could ever imagine. And it could still all be vain. And yet another man, working in a supermarket, working in a fast food restaurant, his life could be full of meaning. What would be the difference? God being in the center of one man's life and God not being anywhere in the other man's life. Everything we do, if God's at the center of it, it brings true meaning and purpose to our life. You know, there's another key phrase that is mentioned, and it goes hand in hand with this. In the book of Ecclesiastes, when Solomon thinks about some of these vain ventures that he was called up in, he'll say it was like grasping or trying to catch the wind. Now you stop and think about that idea for a moment. If something's like trying to grasp or catch the wind, not only is it a vain attempt, it's an utter impossibility. Life without God is like somebody out there trying to catch the wind. It's useless. It's meaningless. Its efforts are going to be cast away for no purpose and value. And thus, we must realize God has to be at the center of everything that we say and we do. Let's think then for just a moment about some of the areas in which Solomon tried to find real meaning. Solomon vain, Solomon's vain attempts can be summed up in a five-fold approach. First, Solomon tried to find meaning in earthly wisdom. A man could search the greatest schools and greatest universities, could read Aristotle and Plato and Socrates till his eyes bug out. And still, with all that wisdom, his life could be vain and meaningless. Why? Earthly wisdom alone won't do it. You can have all the smarts and all the wisdom and, and all the ability to apply it, but if you apply it with no purpose or meaning, if it's just for the here and now on a temporary globe that's one day going to cease to exist, if you spent your life doing that and then all you had to look forward to was the grave, what utter vanity in trying to catch the wind that would be. A second area Solomon looked for meaning in life. He looked for fulfillment and meaning in wealth. Of all the people in the world, Solomon had the wealth. The amount that was brought to him every year when the, when the queen of Sheba came to him, she had heard of his success, and, and when she came to him and actually saw it, do you remember what she said? She said the half of it's not even been told. All the money, all the women, all the luxury that he had, the diamonds, the jewels, the splendor, the gold, you couldn't begin to imagine it. And yet, looking at that, what did Solomon say? 
Vanity of vanities, like trying to catch the wind. If you had all the money in this world and all the gold and all the jewels and, and all the fine luxuries of this world and the only thing you had to look forward to was the day you died, how utterly worthless that type of approach to life would be. A third way in which Solomon looked for fulfillment Solomon looked for fulfillment and meaning in revelry, in pleasure, and in lust. You opened uh, Ecclesiastes chapters 1 and 2, and you see that Solomon tried wine. Uh, there's no doubt that he tried the sensual side of it with the 700 concubines and the 300 wives. Solomon indeed tried that. The lust, the pleasure, where did all that get Solomon? You know, you don't have to look very far for that answer. You turn to 1 Kings chapters 10 through 12, and Solomon, because of his foreign wives, is now up on the mountaintop building places of worship and worshiping false gods. What did that do for Solomon? It was vain. It was worthless. It almost cost him his eternal soul because of that. And thus, all the sensual lust and pleasure, that won't really satisfy a man. Another area that Solomon looked to, fulfill, to find real fulfillment was in power. He, he had all the power you could imagine over the whole nation, over other nations, over people, over governments. Solomon had the power. Did power alone provide real fulfillment? No, and here's why. There's some power no man can attain. Power over God, power over the natural order of things, power over circumstance and chance. Nobody has power over that except the Almighty. And thus, you'll never reach the highest level of power without putting your trust in the Almighty. And then a fifth area that Solomon looked for fulfillment was in communing with nature. Solomon wanted to build things. He wanted to have the beautiful, most beautiful gardens around. He wanted to be involved in placing of trees and things of that nature and all the exotic things you could imagine that might go with that. And he could say, I've got this tree or this plant that nobody else has got. Well, did that really give Solomon that much fulfillment? No, because other people had had those before. Other people have those after him. And Solomon will say, all of this was vanity and vexation of the Spirit. Friend, here's what we learn from Solomon. You can have all the wisdom, all the money, all the power, all the things that your friends may never have. You can be involved in every lust and pleasure and sensual desire, and in the end you can still go home, be lonely, and have a void in your life that only God can fulfill. Think through history of men like that, men who had it all, whether it be the Hugh Hefners of the world, whether it be the Alexander Greats of the world, whoever it may be. These men had all the power, might, wealth, desire, lust, and passion, and yet they were still lonely. They still had a void in their life, and everything they did looked like vanity on the day of their death because they weren't prepared for the other side. And so, to have put it correctly, Guy in Wood said it this way. In his commentary, he wrote these words. He said, In Ecclesiastes is revealed the emptiness of life apart from God, here's the purpose, in order that we might learn how rich and full life is with Him. What's Ecclesiastes all about? I can look at Solomon and I can look at his life and I can see how empty, how miserable Solomon was apart from God and then I can think to myself just how great, how rich, how wonderful it is to have life hand in hand, walking footstep in footstep with God and the wonderful blessings that go along with that. Let's take just a moment to learn some insights from the book of Ecclesiastes that will help each of us in this life. First, let's realize that part of a life with purpose and meaning is learning to enjoy life as a child of God. Look in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and I want you to notice verse number 24. The Bible says, Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink 
and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. Now watch this. This also I saw was from the hand of God. You know, you can always be wanting more. You could always say to yourself, I'd like to have the biggest car. I'd like to have my neighbor's house. I'd like to have fancier clothes or a, a better phone or a nicer computer. Or you can say, look how richly God has blessed me with the things I got and how thankful I am to have a roof over my head, food to put in my stomach, clothes to warm my body, and people who love me, and more than anything, a God who seeks my best interest in everything I do and say as I put His kingdom first. And so what's the first thing that has real meaning in life? Learn to enjoy life itself. Life is a blessing from God. Every moment is a moment that we receive from the hand of God. Take advantage of it, live it to the fullest, and be content with what you have. 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10. A second insight from the book of Ecclesiastes is this. You've got to learn to live life in view of eternity. Notice Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I want you to look with me in verse number 11. The scripture says, God has made everything beautiful in its time also he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. What do I got to learn to do to get real meaning and purpose out of life? Friend, you've got to learn to live life in view of eternity. One of Solomon's greatest problems was he was just living for the here and now. He was just living from temporary, mundane, pleasure to pleasure to pleasure. And after a little while, each one of those pleasures would run out. Let's say that you had the money to buy the fastest car on the market right now. How long would that thrill last? Let's say that there was some pleasure and, and you had the power to fulfill that and you fulfilled it to the max. Would that eventually get old? Oh, you bet it would. How do you really live life with meaning? Live it in view of eternity. God has made everything beautiful in its season or time. Also, He's put eternity in their hearts. What do I know about eternity? Oh, I've got a lot of questions. There's a lot of things that my feeble, time-limited, time-bound mind can't begin to imagine. But I do know this. I have a sense of eternity in my heart in my mind, and so do you. I know this here is the temporary side. This here is the corruptible side. There is an eternal, there is an incorruptible side, and that's what we're longing for. Friend, if I can ever begin to change my thinking to see that everything I'm doing right now, I'm doing with a view toward eternity. Oh, how that'll make life a real meaning and real purpose. I'm reminded of the two questions Jesus asked in the 8th chapter of Mark, verses 36 and 37. Jesus said, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If you had all the wealth of Solomon and you lost your soul, wouldn't you say that was vanity of vanities? Indeed, it would be, my friend. A third insight that we learn from the book of Ecclesiastes is the value of friends in this life. The people that we have in our life, whether it be one's spouse, whether it be close friends and family, part of having a life of meaning is to realize the value of those relationships. Notice Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and I want you to listen to the words of verses 9 through 12. The Bible says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, 
two cannot two can withstand him and a threefold cord is not quickly broken you know from this passage we learn the power we learn the importance we learn the security and the protection of friends of family of one's spouse in this life a, a life that has real meaning is a life that has people in it who care about you for who you are people like you who are trying to live according to the teaching of Christ, who are trying more than anything to go to heaven, and who are striving to bring glory to God in their life. Then another insight that we find in the book of Ecclesiastes is simply this. We've got to learn the, the fleeting and the shallow nature of the pleasures that we have in this life. I want you to notice chapter 5. Verse number 15, as Solomon, and you've got to understand kind of the mindset, Solomon's in to understand this. He hasn't quite got to the point, he does it a little later, he hasn't quite got to the point where he's factoring God into every decision. He's still, we might say, a little discouraged and a little depressed, and, and he's looking at these pleasures, and he's trying to find meaning in, in those pleasures alone. Here's what his conclusion is. Verse 15, as he came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. He shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. In essence, he said what Job said. Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job chapter 1, verse 20 through 22. What did Solomon here admit to? All the money, all the wealth, all the fine homes and cars and jewelries, uh, the fanciest amenities of this life. Friend, they just won't make you happy. I hope you'll listen real carefully to what we're trying to say, what Solomon, what God is trying to say. If your life is searching for meaning and stuff, you'll never find it. All the junk in the world can't make you happy. God is the only source of true happiness. How do we know that? Happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the godly, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, nor stands in the path of sinners, but happy is the man who walks in the counsel of the Lord. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. And thus pleasure, no matter how much the momentary impulse may be, it just won't make you happy in this life. You've got to realize that if you're going to have meaning in life. Another lesson that we learn from the book of Ecclesiastes is we've got to learn in this life to trust God. I want you to notice as Solomon's tone begins to change a little bit, listen to what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, beginning in verse number 13. The Bible says, Solomon speaking, Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked. Verse number 20, There is not a just man on the earth who does good and does not sin. Now verse number 29, Truly, this only have I found, that God made man upright. They've sought out many schemes. Solomon says, if, if God makes it straight, who can make it crooked? Solomon says, as it comes to men, don't put your trust in them. They've sought out many schemes against, against him and... There's nobody who's perfect. Who do I trust then? God. You've got to learn in this life to put your trust in the Lord, not in men. The Bible says in Proverbs 3 verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Then as we think about life and as we think about meaning in life, let's realize as Solomon did that sometimes both good and bad happen to all men alike. Notice chapter 9, verses 2 and verse number 11. Solomon said, All things come alike to all. One event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good, the clean, and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. Now listen to verse number 11. Solomon said, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not too swift, nor the battle too strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Friend, we live in a world where there are natural laws. 
We live in a world where there are circumstances that sometimes we just can't control, but let's realize this. Good and bad do happen to all men alike. Now, here's the factor that you have to consider. Yes, it's true. Good and bad will happen to all men alike. But friend, if good and bad happen to you and you're a Christian, you've got somebody to glorify for the good and you've got somebody to help you when the bad comes. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, ultimately, as Romans 8, 28 teaches. Now, as we think about the book of Ecclesiastes and as we bring things full circle, we're reminded of what the whole book is all about. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Solomon, you've searched it all out with wisdom from on high. You squandered some of that. You wasted some of that. But it looks like now you've kind of got it in focus. Let's hear the conclusion. Fear God. Keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Why? For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. All the pleasures, where are they, Solomon? They didn't really matter anyway. All the women, what happened to them? Couldn't make me happy. All the buildings, they're decaying. Well, what's life all about? These two things. Fear God. Keep His commandments. That's the whole duty of man. Why am I here? Why are you here? What's life all about? I'm here to fear. That means to honor to reverence, and to respect God. My life is here to glorify God. Isaiah 43, verse 7, God said, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him, yes, I have made him, and I am here to obey God. Friend, have you obeyed God? Do you believe in Jesus? John 8, 24. Are you willing to change your life? Luke 13, 3. Would you make that good confession? Romans 10, verse 10. And would you be immersed in water? to obey the commandment of Christ, Mark 16, 16. And then, having done that, would you walk in newness of life, Romans 6, verse 4, and be faithful unto death. Friend, we hope and pray that you will as we search for real meaning by putting God into the center of our life. May God help you to do just that. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wives. And to God be we encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.